Well, it is a great honor and a pleasure to welcome once again to the show, uh, Professor Justin Jackson. He's the professor of English at Hillsdale College. How are you today, Justin? Thank you for joining us doing again. Great. Doing great. How are you? I'm doing very well. Good. Um, so today we are focusing on uh, the story of King David as told in the Bible. And of course, uh, your free online course on Hillsdale College about the story of King David. Uh, but I would like to first uh, begin by asking you about um, an intellectual influence of yours, um, Rene Girard. Um, who is he and uh, what did you learn oh. from him? Oh, goodness, sure. Um, so I um, I met and then um, um, learned from Rene, oh gosh, back in the, over 20 years ago. Uh, a professor of mine at Purdue was one of Rene's first a graduate students to graduate uh, in it in the U.S. and so um, I started learning his stuff in my youth. Um, I was always very interested in uh, mythology. Um, uh, I grew up with the PBS uh, special, the interviews uh, with uh, Joseph Campbell, mm -hmm. uh, that was um, um, there that they recorded towards the end of his career, and so I always loved. I always loved that archetypal stuff when I was a when I was a kid, um, and so uh, reading Girard was very uh, eye opening to me. He was kind of undoing a lot of the stuff that I loved uh, very much in my youth, and I just loved the way he read literature. So much of it was so simple and also so profound. Um, in fact, these courses, <clears throat> these uh, these courses on biblical literature. Um, Girardian insights are all all throughout them. Um, you know, I like to say the course on the David story is somewhat of a Dostoevskian reading of of First and Second Samuel. But Dostoevsky was very much a he was very much a teacher of an uh, influence uh, of of Girard's. Um, it really is uh, Dostoevsky is what brought Girard back into the Catholic Church one more time. Um, wow. So anyway, uh, he was a wonderful man, very charitable. Um, always willing to um, give a reading, listen to a reading, um, correct gently, I suppose, which is a nice, uh, his insights were always just very brilliant. And also they're brilliant, but so very simple uh, is, as well. Of course. Um, so in the course on King David, as well as the other online course on Genesis, you focus on the text as a work of literature. So um how would, how do you explain how do you explain the uh, approach to the Bible not as a religious text but a literary text? Sure, <clears throat> and look, we could <clears throat> we could treat it as a historical text as well. And mm -hmm. so I don't, I really don't mean these categories to be mutually exclusive. Um, by by treating it as a piece of literature, I think what I'm telling the audience is I am going to privilege the literary aspects over the historical or over the religious um, uh, narrative as well. But it doesn't mean that it's supposed to be opposed to it. In fact, um, I tell students all the time, take these literary insights and, and apply them to your own religious life, your own religious uh, background. So, um, so to read something as a literary text is just simply asking, how does this religious or even historical text, how does it even get put on the page? Well, it, it has to employ certain literary techniques in order to tell its story. And, 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 and be they poetic expressions, uh, biblical prose uh, uses a lot of the same formal qualities that uh, biblical poetry uses. So that's an example. Um, um, repeated words, repeated images, uh, parallel uh, scenes, uh, the way in which Saul tries to trick and betray David comes up again, the way in which David tries to trick and betray Uriah as, uh, as well. Um, so so I, I emphasize the literary because I think most people, if you ask them, what's a biblical, you know, what what is a Bible doing? How does it tell its story? I think for the most part, they'll say, well, it's a religious text, which is absolutely true. And that probably is its primary way to be understood, or they'll say it's a historical text. Um, um, and then the literary just kind of falls to the wayside. And, and maybe it's just because I'm a literature uh, professor. Um, but if it's telling its religious or historical narrative, it's it's using these sort of literary devices to do so. So I, th I think it's very fruitful. 
to be able to study the Bible in in whatever ways we go about reading it. I I just think that the kind of this literary approach really should help everyone find something uh, in whatever it is that they want to study the Bible for in its primary primary mode. Here's something that's very curious. Um, um, I I often get emails um, that are really very angry uh, with me um, for taking a literary approach. And I'll have people tell me, you say this is poetry, you're an idiot. Uh, this is history. And and I, I honestly, I don't, I think what they hear when they hear poetry or literary, they hear something that is fiction or a lie, that it's, that it's something um, that is completely made up and has no relevance um, um, to capital T truth, nor to our daily lives. And so uh, I get that response often. And it's, you know, it's obviously absurd. All you have to do is open Isaiah and you'll see that it's poetry um, or Jeremiah or the Psalms. Um, so, um, I, you know, I, I hope I don't irritate people whenever they watch the classes, but I do stick to a very literary approach. And my concern isn't with uh, grand theological insights. I'm not talking about. Um, I'm not. I'm not talking about the viewer's salvation, how to be saved, where their soul goes after death. Um, that's not the purpose of these of these courses. Mm -hmm. Yes, and since you mentioned it, briefly comment on how the value of the Bible as a historical text as well. Oh sure, um, um, its value as a historical text is my goodness. You have to, um, you have to know kind of where you've been and where you're going. Um, and in some ways, uh, these biblical texts that kind of repeat the same uh, mistakes over and over, I, I think historically speaking, um, Israel has lived out very much a penitential narrative, one of exile and return. We still live this out. Um, um, uh, right now we're in Lent and Lent is supposed to kind of Keep, keep us very mindful of the exile and return the exile from God when we uh, when we disobey you know we have a we have a merciful God uh, who's long suffering and compassionate uh, you know who desires not the death of the sinner but that he turn back to God and and be saved well I, I find that to be um, absolutely crucial to the historical narrative that that these books of the Bibles tell. Uh, Bible told poetically. Maybe that's the easiest formula. A lot of historical narratives told poetically. Are, are there some things told poetically that that maybe, what would I say, um, are not an accurate unfolding of chronological events? Yes, because sometimes uh, that's just not what um, uh, these authors are trying to get at, is that sort of absolute accuracy. Um, of those events as they unfold. Um, that's where sometimes I think falling back on the poetic helps us perhaps get at capital T truth a little better than what um, a, a historical analysis uh, will do. But certainly the two ought not be pitted against one another. Was there a King David? Yes. Uh, there's There's little archaeological evidence, but it's there. Biblical texts are what give us uh, that that main story of David, and it's it's an incredible story. And I would say this: <clears throat> thank God, thank God, um, um, he didn't inspire it in a dry historical uh, manner, but rather allowed his prophets, rather allowed those within uh, the ancient church to be inspired poetically to give us these much, I think, more profound. Uh, uh, psychological, and by psychological, I mean soul uh, truths than just simple, is it historically accurate, or did they get every date correct, or etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, and um, I should say that personally, um, ever since our last conversation, I've uh, completed my conversion process to the Roman Catholic Church, and the reason why I became a, from a non-religious person to a religious one is uh, actually inspired not least in part by yourself who have uh, taught me to um, look at the Bible through a literary perspective since I'm already a big reader or a, a great admirer of the great, the great literary works I've come to appreciate the Bible as and for its literary value and then over time its historical and its uh, religious truth value in that I am 
unlike many atheists who believe that uh, the entirety of the Bible is made up, I I think that a work of um, literature this profound cannot be entirely made up, or it has to be well, true, right? Well, think about it this way. I mean, I think scripture is one, it's given, you know, it's given to the church to know something about God and about God's relationship with man. It's also teaching us about man's relationship to man, God's relationship to creation, man's relationship to creation. And so when we read, um, you know, when we read Psalm uh, uh, 50 slash 51, you know, have mercy on me, O God, according to thy great mercy, according to the multitude of your compassion, blot out my transgression, right? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me of my sin. Well, we know that in that psalm, that's supposed to be David when he's losing his child that he has with Bathsheba. But when we're reading that psalm, I don't sit there and think about David losing his child to Bathsheba. That psalm becomes personal. Yeah. It becomes my psalm. It, it becomes it becomes my poem that that I get to um, uh, uh, say to God. It becomes my own. It becomes part of me. And I think that's uh, that's the important aspect. Uh, there of scripture as well we could I, I don't think anyone reads that psalm in a historical way <laughs> they're not trying to figure out what is the date of it, mm -hmm. uh, it that's I mean it's fine and you know I, I like that sort of scholarship um, but the most important thing for it is the way that the that the psalm both speaks to our soul and then after speaking to our soul from our soul to direct us towards God that seems to me to be the primary uh, that seems to me to be the primary role of, of scripture itself. Yes, of course. And I, I think I should mention that once some of the books, for example, Isaiah is a book of prophecies and also the final book of the New Testament, Revelations, is definitely not historical at all. Um, yeah, so that brings us to the story of King David. Um, uh, you've said that it started at the first book of Samuel, chapter one, and it ends at the first book of Kings, um, chapter two. Yeah. And why did you uh, bookmark those, uh, bookend those in that order? Yeah, so so uh, uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, um, because it is, <clears throat> David, you can't, you can't um, kind of pull David away from Samuel, and you can't pull Samuel away from Saul, and you can't pull Saul away from David. So it's actually, <laughs> uh, in the course, I, I kind of give a it's it's a long the course is a, <clears throat> a long meditation on the relationship between fathers and sons mm -hmm. and quite honestly destructive relationships between fathers and sons you could see why i say um to be anachronistic it's a very dostoevsky in reading because so much of dostoevsky is especially his his, his greatest novel the brothers uh, k is about fathers and sons um so what's so beautiful about the opening of it is it's actually about a faithful mother and her son <laughs> with with mm -hmm. Samuel whom she dedicates to God that, and that's just this beautiful i think beautiful moment that in some ways if we could just begin and end <laughs> first and second Samuel with Hannah pleading with God to give her a child and then offering her child back to God my goodness all of the disasters that we see in those two uh, <clears throat> those two books of Samuel, um, we, we wouldn't we wouldn't actually see those if it would just be fathers tending to their children properly, giving them guidance, um, mm -hmm. showing them what it means to be dedicated to God. Um, um, you know, uh, what would I say? Uh, history probably would have been a lot cleaner. Uh, Israel probably would have never needed a king. Uh, <laughs> David wouldn't have committed adultery. And I mean, all these things just fall apart with the simple faith of, of Hannah and her dedication of, of Samuel uh, to God. So I love to begin there because it kind of starts us off on good footing. And of course, you know, immediately we see, you know, we see Eli and his good for nothing sons. But then I like to end um, uh, with the second chapter of Kings because it's it's essentially the death of David and Solomon taking over as king. And you see the rapidity with which Solomon, what would I say, fixes all of David's political problems. Solomon's ready to just pull the, you know, pull the trigger on Joab and just be done, uh, just be done with that problem completely. So th there's kind of a cleanup process uh, uh, there as well. And I think it's important to see David um, 
old and bedridden um, um, lying there uh, with Abishag um, as if she's that lamb, like kind of going back to the uh, to the Nathan prophecy with David one last time, kind of that nice final, what would I say, um, image of David as the shepherd, except now old and, and frail and, and at the end of his, his life. But uh, there's just something about that that image that I love. And many critics find it to be a pathetic image. Look at how pathetic David is here at the end of his life. Uh, maybe so. Um, I, I guess I'm just, and I, I, I admit this uh, in, in the online class, um, I, I'm very much a psalmic reader of David. It's hard for me to go through and read the David story without knowing the psalms that, that correspond uh, with it. So um, um, I, I guess I just take his repentance uh, uh, seriously, which, by the way, doesn't mean that's the only way to read it. There are brilliant um, uh, political readings of David uh, that are not too kind or sympathetic to him. In fact, it's a great book by uh, uh, Moshe uh, Halbertal and Stephen Holmes, and it's called The Beginning of Politics. Mm. Um, it's wonderful. It's a it's a very, very, it's a literary reading and a political reading of the way in which David uh, you know, has to build uh, his his kingdom, and and I don't shy away from uh, the 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 rotten things David does to build a kingdom. This is what God tells Israel is going to happen if they want a king. Look, if you want a king and you want to play politics, um, good luck with that. Uh, and and God tries to warn them away from it, uh, and nevertheless, He also gives to them what they desire. Mm -hmm. So, of course, yes. Um, and since you mentioned God, um. I'd like to ask you this. So the story is the story of David, but um, the way I see it, it's not about David. It's about God, as all the Bible is. So um, can you comment a bit on the presence of God throughout this tale? Yeah, that's an that's an excellent question. Like I said, the first place, and he's, he's especially there, the first place I think you really have to look to um, it is the is the Samuel narrative. I think you have to begin because Hannah is the one who appeals to God. It's it's a you know kind of a common biblical a scene: the barren woman um, who's being harassed um, um, by another um, who goes to God and prays for a child, uh, and Samuel becomes this. I guess what we, we he becomes a, a prophet of, of sorts. Um, a religious leader, certainly, who also his sons don't follow in his way. In fact, in fact, Israel comes to Samuel and what do they request specifically? Your sons have not followed in your way. Give us a king. And of course, there's God. So God is already there listening to Hannah to ask for Samuel. God is there kind of directing Samuel along the way, telling him um, um, uh, whom to anoint. Um, um, telling him, you know, Saul has acted treacherously. Go after David. He's a man after my own heart. And um, and it's not that God doesn't know what David's going to do by the end of all this stuff, which I think is a really important point. It, it, God already knows that the Psalms tell us repeatedly. He knows the sins that we've committed and and are going to commit, right? If God sits outside of, of space and time, um, th then uh, he gets to see everything all at once. So he 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 anoints David, knowing who David is going to be. Um, this is why I say I I think a lot of the history of Israel is one about um, um, a, a demonstration of the merciful nature of God. That that um, if you want to exile yourself, it turns out he may allow you to exile yourself, and then you will suffer. But when you cry out in your suffering, he will listen to you and 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 turn back to you so long as you turn back to him. And I think this gets repeated again and again and again in, in, in the David story. Well, note, I think, after the death of David and Bathsheba's first child, it's pretty interesting because I think, I'll say it, I, and I think it's accurate, God, I think, becomes more and more removed uh, from that from that narrative because I think it is a story about David's own wrestling with his own sort of punishment. Remember, he brings down this curse on himself. Mm -hmm. He says to Nathan, 
you know, that man ought to be paid back fourfold. And it turns out this is what's going to happen to David. And I think David, I think in some ways, if God is pulled back out of the narrative, I think in some ways God is ever present simply because I think it's David wrestling with his own um, responsibility in understanding the disaster that has come upon his his family. I, I think his not wanting to punish uh, uh, Absalom um, and letting Absalom run wild, I don't think it's because he doesn't care or that he's um, a, a bad king. Uh, look, uh, terrible political decisions, letting Absalom run wild like this, terrible. But he's also his father. And I'm I'm not sure that he knows what he's supposed to be doing because everything that's happening, I think David can go back to that moment when he murdered Uriah and slept with Bathsheba and and um, essentially cursed himself uh, with that anger. And so I think he's so even in those places where I think God is and this is just in first and second Samuel, we know in the Psalms that will find its places at various places in uh, David's story. We know David's praying to God in those places. So in that way, we know God is ever present in David's prayer life. I'm just talking about first and second Samuel uh, here. Um, I think his fear of, of Saul is, is, you know, where he's needing uh, uh, God's protection repeatedly. And that's what comes out in the Psalms again and again. So I think a heavy presence of the divine of God, um, um, early on, up to the Uriah Bathsheba, when David is is pleading for the life of the child, and I find that, I find that moment, uh, it's the moment whenever he's supposed to have written um, Psalm fifty slash fifty one. Um, I find that to just be an, a, a, one of the most powerful scenes I've seen in all of literature, and and just pretend, um, you know, I'm not a believer. Just pretend it's just a piece of literature seeing him fasting and praying for the life of his child. Um, and then the way when he finds out that he's dead, he has that line where he says, <clears throat> um, um, he's not coming back to me, rather I'm going back to him. I mean, you think about this and that sort of responsibility for David to know that the life of that child is due to David's actions uh, is really quite stunning. I, I don't know that he ever... I don't know that he recovers, nor do I think he ought to recover. And maybe again, I'm not a very good political reader of this story. Um, I think I think he lives a lot of his life in in the shadow of 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 uh, kind of the destruction that that he's wrought uh, with his children. Yeah, I see. Um, I think I would also like to mention the fact that well, if you look at the Old Testament, most of it takes place in a very small corner of the Middle East. Yes. And now we've known a lot more about the world than that. And but nevertheless, the the values, the virtues which are professed in the Bible uh, has very much a universal appeal, despite the fact that we know of many particular peoples and you know, the Israelites are also a very particular people. So how is it that a um a story that's been revealed to a very particular people by uh, by God carries such a universal appeal. Well, well, that's that's an uh, that's an excellent question. Um, goodness, that that would take what would I say? That would take a long time to unravel and answer that question. And that's one of those where I think, in some ways, I would have to return to all of my work with Rene Girard, he gives, and, and maybe I'll just answer it here and it'll infuriate your viewers because it's going to be a brief answer, but it goes something like this. When you read most world mythology, um, um, one definition of mythology would be the way in which we try to cover up violence. Um, that, that, um, that it goes, um, Usually there's a crisis within a community and the community will come together to expel or to kill that scapegoat, that one person that we think is to blame. And then the community feels better about it because clearly, and notice, they feel better, which means there's been a peace brought to that community. 
through that individual or group of people who have been exiled or killed. And then we convince ourselves that truly those people must have been guilty because look at how much better we feel. When in fact, that's all a lie. It's a complete lie. That maybe those people, they weren't guilty for the disorder that was brought to the community. And so what you see in the Hebrew Bible, I think, is what I like to call an unmasking. It's an unmasked, unmasking of the of this myth of redemptive violence. Um, um, and it's there in the Hebrew Bible uh, brilliantly um, in places. And then I think it has its fullest expression as an extension of the Hebrew Bible and the gospel texts. So when Christ says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, I think he literally means they have no idea what they're doing here, scapegoating me like this. But what that culmination is between the Hebrew Bible all the way through to the gospel uh, texts is it is a revelation, a profound revelation of the victim uh, um, mechanism, the way in which we create victims in this world. Um, and I think, um, I think uh, everything post um, um, post Christianity, post institutionalized church, which is not to say that the historical church hasn't had hasn't made plenty of scapegoats and victims, of course. Um, um, but but we would say right that was contrary to gospel teaching, um, and so I think the reason why it is so popular is that there is or is so. I don't know, expansive, people know it um, um, because this idea of turning away from creating victims and even more so to, to um, what would I say, to sacrifice oneself. It's to move from a sacrificial system of, of, of uh, these old religions to, to a self-sacrificial system that we see in Judaism and Christianity. And I think, I think, um, um, I think in some ways, this is precisely what I was doing with a lot of the Genesis uh, narrative uh, that I was, um, uh, the class that I taught on that. I don't get too much into it in the David story, because I don't know that there's a lot of self-sacrifice there. I think I think David is actually struggling with the fact that he sacrificed another for his own joy, his own his own peace. But if you think about it now, how many movies, how many novels, um, where the hero is self uh, will offer himself. I mean, it's it's everywhere. Um, uh, probably the American director who's picked up on it the most, maybe in his career, especially towards the end, is Clint Eastwood. Right? He used to give you all sorts of westerns where you had the myth of redemptive violence. Somebody killed your brother. Somebody killed your wife. You went and killed them, and gee, that made the world all work out just perfectly. Uh, and then he broke through with a Western called The Unforgiven, where I think he I think he undoes a lot of his all his previous um, uh, his previous uh, Westerns. Uh, probably um, the most explicit he gets with this. Have you seen Gran Torino? Uh, no, but I've heard of it. Yes. Oh, so Gran Torino is another movie that he directs. And and um, he's an old racist curmudgeon vet uh, who befriends um a Hmong family who is being terrorized by uh, gang members, um, and I won't I won't ruin it for you and for others who haven't seen it. Um, but it becomes an ex it, he becomes an explicit Christ figure at the end. So go watch the movie and you'll see it, um, and you're like, oh, that's that's pretty explicit. So um, I th I think uh, um, um, Judaism and Christianity in the way in which they work to unmask these myths, um, there is something that's that's profound when I think other cultures run into them. This is also why I'm not afraid when you read Genesis or Exodus and you notice, or the book of Job especially, you notice all these other Canaanite myths. Some students get very, uh, what would I say, uh, they get very nervous whenever I say that because it's, oh, then this can't be inspired if they're using Canaanite myths. That's not the case at all. They're using all sorts of Canaanite myth and imagery to undo it, to show them our God is not like your God. You know, in fact, 
And if it's if it's in Second Temple Judaism, your gods are actually these fallen angels, and our gods far more powerful than these gods. And look at what he teaches us. And essentially, it's it's a teaching of of um, um, obedience, um, uh, mercy, um, um, self sacrifice, which then means suffering. Um, um, and and you know I, I'm I'm convinced that that's uh, that's why, as you as you mentioned, that's why it has become, uh, I don't know, an almost indispensable uh, narrative. Though perhaps in 2023, we're moving away from it even more. We seem to have done something quite different. Now we're, we're still concerned about victims. Um, I, think, I think someone like Friedrich Nietzsche would be appalled um, um, as to how much we hoist victims up on a pedestal now. Um, but notice we only do that so that we can find their true victimizers and then make victims out of them. Like all we do is scapegoat each other. Uh, and this is a great Girardian insight. But after Christianity, I think, and after Christ's revelation, um, the scapegoat mechanism just won't work anymore. Mm -hmm. We just run through our cycles too very quickly because the whole thing has been exposed. We know what we're doing now. Um, and I think that happens with the with the Hebrew Bible and, and the New Testament. I think that's a lot of what um, um, is is happening there in in those scriptures. Not not every story, not every moment, but I think it has a lot to. I think it has a lot to do uh, uh, with with scripture. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Sorry, that was a rambling answer, but oh, but I blame you because I, <laughs> I blame you. That was a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, that was wonderful. Um, I'll, I'll follow up with you when I see Gran Torino by Clint Eastwood. But um, when you mentioned Clean Eastwood, I um, I'm reminded of uh, one of my favorite musicians, the great Nick Cave from Australia. And yeah, uh, um, you know, if you're familiar enough with his uh, discography, you would see that uh, in his earlier works, he borrows a lot from the Bible. But then, but then he he emphasizes on the violence, uh, especially of the Old Testament, the Cain and Abel, and of course the David and Absalom part. But recently, he has he has been rereading the Bible, I guess, or being re-inspired by it in a very psalmic manner. He focuses yeah. on the poetic aspects of it, of the yeah. um, highs and lows of despair and joy of um, finding God and transgressing God. And it probably has to do with, you know, seeing his um, one of his sons die a premature death. But yes, yeah. and I think one of his recent works is called Seven Psalms, where he tries to do, <laughs> do the... <laughs> To tries to do one of the psalms in his style seven times. So I'm, I think it, it it depends on how you read the Bible, how you read the Christ story that can lead you to your work. Well, just, I mean, just think about the Cain and Abel story. You just brought this up. The Cain and Abel story. God literally tries to warn Cain, right? So Cain's offering isn't accepted, and God comes to him and he says, "Why is your face fallen? Why are you angry?" Then he has a line. He says. Um, and you know this is going on in Cain's mind because it goes on in our mind because we want to know why didn't you uh, why didn't you accept Cain's offering? And so we make up all of our different reasons. Oh, this is an old god. This is uh, he needs blood, or uh, Cain didn't offer the best of his grain, or whatever that is. All right, we're playing that game that it's about the object. But God says um, whether you offer well or whether you do not. So he's, what he's saying is, Cain, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking what's wrong with the object of sacrifice, but it has nothing to do with the object of sacrifice. He says, sin crouches at your tent flap, at your door. He goes, but you must overcome it. Well, look at what he's doing for Cain. He, and we know what Cain's problem is. This, is. this is the first sibling rivalry that we have in Genesis, and that's in chapter 4. He knows Cain's murderous inten intention. He's reading for Cain the drama in which Cain finds himself. He's, he's essentially saying, you know you want to murder your brother. Don't do it. You must overcome this. And then, of course, Cain goes and he murders his brother. But look at what God does. He says, you know, um, what have you done? Where is your brother? Those questions are a call to repentance. Confess what you've done, Cain. Cain refuses. He says, am I my brother's keeper? So what, are, you know, uh, if uh, uh, sometimes the vengeful, angry Old Testament God is, is um, 
I think oftentimes it's a severe misreading because what does God do to Cain at the first murder? You would think he would just take him out and said, well, you killed your brother. Now I'm going to kill you. But what does he do? He puts a mark on him and he says, no one will touch you. He, he exiles him. You now have to go out from this land, but he lets him live. And he says, and I'll protect you. Whoever touches you, I'll take vengeance sevenfold, though we're not told of any of those who ha it happens. So what does he try to do with the first murder? He tries to stop the whole process. So that's always astounding to me that here you had a God who was warning Cain. I know what you're thinking, and I know what you want to do to your brother. And by the way, I, the gospel picks up on this um, um, quite a bit because they ask, <clears throat> Um, you know, what's the least that you have to do to go make your offering at the temple? And the rule's very simple. You must reconcile yourself with your brother. And then it gets even worse because then, you know, in another place, um, um, Christ is asked, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? So there's your seven psalms. And Christ says, rather, 70 times seven. <laughs> so this is what's at stake. And I'm sorry, um, unless your Christology is seriously, seriously flawed, Christ can only speak what the Father speaks. They share a will. So whatever Christ reveals to us, as St. John calls him, he's the icon of God, he's the image of God, then that's precisely what the Father wills. So, so there's your long-suffering, merciful, compassionate. All we ever have to do is just keep going back. Um, I think to, you know, Exodus 34, 6, it lays out all those attributes of God, which are so very, very important uh, within Judaism. And then, of course, it, get, it gets picked up on uh, in the New Testament uh, uh, tradition. Okay. Well, um, I believe that one of the one of the relationships uh, that foreshadowed that of David and Absalom is that of Eli and his two sons. Um, Hopney and Phineas. Yes. Um, and uh, you, there's that one part in the course where you mentioned that um, I think it was uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 4 and verse uh, 17 to 18. This is where the Philistines have um, broken, in, invaded Israel and took away, the taken away the Ark of the Covenant. And Eli's two sons went into battle and they were killed yeah. and so the messenger uh, and i quote here answered and said israel is fled before the philistines and the messenger mentions first the fact that eli's two sons have been killed yes. and <laughs> secondly the ark of god has taken yes and eli fell off from the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck break and he died for he was an old man and heavy so you you mentioned that the reason why he fell off uh, is not because he heard that his two sons has died, but because the Ark of the Covenant has been taken. Yeah. yeah. And, and the reason why is I'm just reading that poetically. So this is a great example of what a literary reading does. Um, uh, Hebrew poetry will give you parallelism and then an expansion and in, intensification. That's why I think it's hearing about the Ark uh, that really uh, is what sends him over. And it's interesting because <clears throat> I think it's also supposed to prefigure um, uh, the selection of a king because you know what happens to the Philistines after they take the ark. They're just absolutely pummeled. It's it's like the Exodus. It, it's it's the Exodus episode one more time. They're just hit with all these plagues. It's almost comedic. And and so what's the point there? It turns out does. It <laughs> Uh, does Israel really need a king to go and fight their battles for them? <laughs> it turns out they don't. All they need is God because that's mm -hmm. the ark just it destroys them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's supposed to be the, the entire lesson here is that Israel's worried about all these foreign nations and they just got they just got sacked and they literally do nothing to get the ark back. Nothing. God does everything. Just, just being in their presence, which is the whole point whenever he tells Samuel, they haven't rejected you, Samuel, they've rejected me. And notice what he says, they've rejected me. And he just kind of smiles and he's like, that's okay. Israel, they are, and this is what I think is really important. 
Israel, they are my wayward children. I will never abandon them. <laughs> Look at all the times that they say they're sorry, and then they do it again. And yet here I am for them. I'm, I'm, I'm there for my children. I prefer my children not do these harmful things, but I will never leave them. I will always be faithful to them. And so I'm hoping you can see that connection even to David and Absalom. It may be a terrible choice as a king. It may be a political disaster, as Joab points out. Um, um, but that's a father who loves his son uh, and wants him to come back. He wants him to repent, right? It is, it is the story. I think it's 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 the tragic story of the prodigal son, yes. right? Instead of the return to the father, you know, Absalom just goes. Absalom goes goes his way. So, but yes, you're right with with Eli. That that story of those sons kind of gets everything moving for us. Um, um, in inside of the inside of the the narrative itself, mm -hmm. and Saul's interesting, isn't he? Because Saul, it's Saul, his relationship with his children is Jonathan essentially. Um, um, what would I say? He betrays Saul, and and uh, he loves David, uh, and he follows David. Uh, so if if David is a man after God's own heart, well, <laughs> it's say, that's the same with Jonathan, Michael, his own daughter. Um, who loves David, uh, uh, she tricks her father and allows David to escape. Um, so Saul's children undo him in order to protect uh, David. Um, and, and I think that's, and I think their choice was the correct choice. I think Saul, uh, he knows, he knows that David is God's chosen, and yet he refuses to give the kingdom over to David. That's where I think he's being disobedient. I think it becomes political for Saul. He just needs to be king rather than knowing, sorry, Saul, God's taken this from you and he's given it to David. Let's make the transition nice and clean. Saul can't do it. Mm -hmm. And notice that Saul calls him David, my son, in the two reconciliation scenes mm -hmm. uh, in, in, uh, in, in the text. Um, that's beautiful. David, my son. There's that there's that father son language one more time. And Saul finally admits, right, you you are more right than I. The kingdom shall surely be yours. I find that to just be a beautiful, uh, uh, two beautiful moments uh, in, in the text. Yes. And I think if I would like to ask you to perhaps compare and contrast Saul and David. But um, another question which I would like to ask you is, um, why does God choose this, uh, what you'd call broken vessels or people with uh, obvious flaws? Although uh, Saul and David do not share the same sets of virtues and flaws, of course, but sure. they both share in that they were chosen by God. Mm -hmm. So why, what does God see in these two uh, figures? Oh, and it's, it's not just these two figures, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of, it's just kind of a repeated theme throughout i mean one of those one of the <clears throat> key moments <clears throat> in the new testament is usually around nativity season christmas season um, um the church will read uh, the genealogy of christ and there's some pretty unsavory characters <laughs> in that <laughs> genealogy um yeah I, I mean look i think you answer your own question i think the point is is it's god who can take broken people um, but what does that show? I, what it shows me that this is a merciful God, who accepts us and and wants us to obey, even foreknowing that that we won't. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't think it's. Um, a, I don't think it's a very profound insight <laughs> to to be able to understand a God who can who can. I mean, just think of it this way. If God and if God in Genesis creates the first human out of mud, and within three chapters it says he has become like one of us, <laughs> that, that means this is such a great God that he's created little gods out of mud. Mm -hmm. Um, he's called us to be partakers of a divine nature. When they ask Christ, Are you the Son of God? He, he recites. He cites Psalm 82, verse 6, you are all God's sons of the Most High. But isn't it a reflection of the power of God, the glory of God, that he can take mud or he can take those of us 
who who backslide uh, and transgress all the time and yet will make us partakers of the, of the divine nature that's a merciful god the whole you know you're new to the church now but the whole the whole point of confession when you go to confession you're going to confess to a merciful god you know that you're already forgiven so don't hold anything back that's the whole point it's not if I say something and I've transgressed and I tell them this really bad thing, then I'm going to be in big trouble, though the exact opposite is true from this theological uh, uh, perspective. Um, I think it's supposed to show the greatness and majesty of God um, to, to take, you know, a small, a small uh, a country like Israel to take Abraham and to just keep a building off it with all of the failures uh, intact. I mean, look, um, Christ is abandoned by all of his disciples in the synoptic gospels in the gospel of John, uh, St. John is there at the cross, but in the synoptics, he's abandoned. He's denied, mm -hmm. right? He's denied by uh, 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 St. Peter. And yet he comes back and he asks St. Peter, you know, Peter denies him three times and Christ asks him three times after the resurrection. He asks him three times, what? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And notice it just scandalizes Peter. He says, yes, you know, I love you. And and that I think is kind of the point is to, is to uh, the, you know, the glory of God uh, is, um, well, St. Irenaeus will say the glory of God is man fully alive. But man fully alive is a penitential being, right? Would that we could all uh, be without ego and follow <laughs> God in, in a in an egoless way, in a way out of self love, uh, self sacrifice, and a love of others. Would that we could all do that? But <laughs> I mean, my goodness, if I were to, if I were to count every moment of every day in which I, I don't exist like that, then this is a God who ought to just you know flick me from the cosmos but he doesn't he calls us back to uh calls us back to him so i think you answered your own question i think it really is supposed to demonstrate the glory of of god mm -hmm. and to give us hope and to always turn to always turn back mm -hmm. of course and the way i see it the two most um well-known episodes of the life of king david is obviously when he defeats goliath the giant and that is when he proves himself to be worthy of uh, kingship and one where he has a child with Bathsheba. And this is where I think of that word infidelity, which has been used uh, very much these days to refers to, I guess, uh, extramarital affairs and such. But it also refers to uh, the betrayal of the truth in that when, yeah. when David does that, when he goes to lay with Bathsheba and has a child to her he not only betrays his um his wife Michael at that time he also betrays the truth he lies to Uriah uh, the Hittite her husband yeah. and you see it in obviously a contemporary examples of extramarital affairs too where you betray your you know, lawfully wedded spouse and that also includes uh, lying to him and her constantly right no, I, I mean, I think that's right. And you'll you'll notice at the very opening of that chapter, um, it says at the time in which King Sally forth, David is at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this has become a king who's, what would I say? He's become pretty darn soft. Um, and this is a pattern that we just see in scripture. Um, whenever we're soft, you know, oh soul, you've stored up, you've done great. You've stored up all of these things. When we become soft, we oftentimes forget about um, forget about God, and that's precisely what David has done. He is just uh, willing to fulfill uh, to to fulfill to feed all of his own desires, and precisely the way you've, that you've uh, discussed. And not only that, but you know, um, yes, he kills, he murders Uriah, um, um, and and other men, <laughs> other men. Mm -hmm. um, People in the kingdom have to know something's up. Notice everything's done through messengers. People have to know what's gone on. So now, you know, now their king is a murderer and, um, you know, an adulterer, um, turns turns away from God. And of course, uh, 
you know, what does God say? God comes to David, or he goes to Nathan, and he describes that his king, that is to say David, will be a shepherd of his people. Well, it turns out David was a shepherd, and look at how he's treated Uriah. That's why Nathan gives him the parable of the shepherd, because only a shepherd could understand what it means to hand feed, um, you know, that lamb, that little you. That's what, and it, and it angers David, which means what? David has a clear sense of justice and order. He's outraged by his own deeds. <laughs> um, and so, of course, that parable is supposed to get him to repent. And he does repent uh, after after that. But I think you're right. I mean, it's infidelity on multiple uh, multiple levels to God, to his fellow man, to Bathsheba. I, I mean, just go down the list to all of the messengers, to Joab, though I don't think Joab cares much about David being unfaithful to the men, Joab is, seems to me to be the consummate kind of uh, uh, a power-hungry uh, politician. Um, so, yeah, I think you're absolutely right with the uh, with seeing the multiple levels of his infidelity. You can see why I think this is the moment that just absolutely crushes him. Mm -hmm. um, again, he has to he has to live with this, and you can repent, and I think he repents. You can repent, but if you've done something terrible. Though you've repented and even been forgiven, and God accepts his repentance, God says he is forgiven, um, and the child is going to, uh, but the child is going to die. Okay, well, but he's still going to live with this, and he does. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, <laughs> and and then he, and then comes the disaster of his other children, right? And, yes. So, so um, this is a this is a wonderful literary example of the Bible, the story of David, in which uh, you pointed out to me. Um, so when Bathsheba was first introduced, um, she was referred to as Bathsheba, wife of Uriah the Hittite. And Correct. even when David conceived of a child with her, she is still referred to as such. Um, I'm yes. looking at uh, for uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 10. Um, yes. Thou hast despised me, uh, God, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. But David, when he knows that his firstborn is going to die as punishment for his transgression, um, verse 24, and David com comforted Bathsheba, his wife. Yeah. And so um, what has changed there? Yeah, well, I, I think it's I think it's now I think it's a recon I think it's at least the beginning, a, a reconciliation uh, between David and Bathsheba. If they've both repented, and I think, you know, the story doesn't go into the details about Bathsheba, but I have to imagine she mourned as well. Um, um, and so I think the two of them coming together with this with this tragedy, for which they're both responsible, and we can say perhaps David even more so, because he's the one who called on Bathsheba, um, to, call, to call her his wife at this point, I think is supposed to say, okay, God is forgiven. That's in the past. And again, it doesn't mean we forget about it, but that, that misdeed is there. We've we got those two or three reminders that she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And now we can finally say, and here's the break where Bathsheba is now uh, the wife of David, right? Um, um, so that the two have come together. And again, I, I don't know that there's, um, what would I say? I don't know that there's kind of a, a a happy moment there to mark that reconciliation other than that tiny little line. And I think that's the power of, I think that's the power of uh, biblical literature. You have to be a very close, attentive reader to the repetitions, uh, to the parallelism, uh, to, to, to the small changes uh, um, like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now we get to the children, David, which is a, story of tragedy all around yeah. um yeah. he begat absalom um amnon and tamara uh amnon uh one episode he forced himself onto his sister and absalom uh being enraged by that act kills him and yeah. later on he went to war with his own father king david yeah. and yeah. one of the details that you um <clears throat> that you point out um i think it was in uh, Second Samuel, I think either chapter eighteen or nineteen, um, when uh, King David finally defeated the armies of Absalom, 
well, um, you know, his uh, his soldiers uh, says, "Well, we've defeated your your victorious." And David asks, "Well, what what of my son?" And they 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 inform him that well, Absalom has passed away. And I think this is um eighteen thirty three. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I die for thee? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. So. Yeah. The parallel between uh, David and his two uh, Eli, sorry, and his two sons um, reveals yeah. itself here. So, um, okay. yeah, would you care to elaborate on that? No, I mean, I think you laid it out. I think you laid it out beautifully. I would add. I would add one more detail to pay attention to. Okay. So, um, if you notice the scene with uh, Amnon and Tamar, uh, that David actually has to act as the go-between. <laughs> He's the one that has to hand her over to him, which is just brutal, which means he he has some, so the way in which he found go-betweens for him and Bathsheba, he's now being forced to be that go-between for Amnon and Tamar. So that's one. He has to be a go-between again when Absalom comes to him and says, send my brothers to the sheep shearing. Um, uh, he has to get David's permission. And of course, David gives his permission a second time. So there is um, there is still a, a sort of what I say that curse that David calls down upon himself revisits him with that sort of responsibility that he now has, even with the disasters that are that are coming. And I don't I don't really have any other comment to make on the Absalom. Absalom, is it politically a disaster? Sure, is Joab right that you know the men are going to be angry? They're all going to leave you. Yeah, probably. Though, let me just say, if one is siding with Joab in the David story, you may want to rethink that position. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't. David at his worst is is, and what I mean by his worst, his most political. And I realize, in order to put together a kingdom, you know, at this at this time, say in a thousand BC, to put together a kingdom, you have to be pretty brutal, and you have to do certain things and shed blood, which is why David can't uh, is not allowed to build the temple. He has too much blood on his hands. David, at his most political, David, when people talk about him as a very shrewd leader, and he is, he's at his shrewdest, and he's at his most political when he cuts Joab loose, when he lets Joab go do what. So. Yes, I get that Joab's probably giving him good political advice. Um, but for me, <clears throat> um, I, I just, I find the story just rem just remarkable in as much as we get to feel the pain of David, not David the king, but David the father that bears his weight on him. And um, um, I think it is very reminiscent of his first child that he loses. Because remember what he says about his first child. He's not coming back to me. I'm going back to him. And I think David means it. As being a good shepherd, I think David means it. Absalom, Absalom, would that I had died in your stead. A good shepherd, we're told, a good shepherd will lay down his life uh, uh, for his flock. And I think that's all David is expressing here, is that I think I think he's willing to take on that shepherd role uh, one more time. Uh, what would I say? A, a non-political a non kingly shepherd uh, uh, role here. And it's difficult because, you know, he's a father and he's also a king. Um, and in, in Joab saying, you know, you would rather that he lived and that you have all of these problems. And by the way, Joab knows Absalom needs to be taken down. He can't he can't live if we're going to have any sort of peace in this kingdom. Joab is far more politically astute than what David is uh, in this case. Yeah, okay, uh, I guess. <laughs> but but uh, I, what would I say? Um, Joab's will come and go, um, but the pain that King David feels, yeah, that's something that I think cuts to the heart of what it what it means to be a human and especially uh, especially a parent. Um, I, I have to imagine every parent when they when they read that of of what King David is going through, I I and I don't even hesitate. I'd, I'd be a terrible statesman, uh, but I'd throw my kingdom away just to have my child back, especially if I felt that I bore that responsibility in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even have to think twice. Wow.
In other words, don't ever elect me for anything. I'd be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so uh, I love to ask you many, many more questions, but unfortunately, we are at the end of our time. But I'd like to end with this. So, Jesus Christ, we're told in the first, um, uh, first chapter, first verse of uh, Saint Matthew, he's the son of David. So, in what ways are his uh, distant father, King David, reflected in in Christ? Um, sure. Um, let's just go to the Absalom, Absalom, or even the death of his first child. He's not coming back to me. Rather, I'm going to him. Um, Christ is that good shepherd. Christ is the good shepherd um, um, uh, who actually can show you what a shepherd king would be like and why. Um, because Peter was Absalom. <laughs> he turned away from him. He betrayed him. He, he denied him. Um, um, all of us are his first child. When David says, <clears throat> he's not coming back to me, rather I'm going to him. What does Christ go and do for us? We're not coming back to God. So what does God do? God empties himself and goes into Sheol, Hades and rescues us. He puts on human nature. Right? He shares what we are, and, he, and with his human soul, united to his divine nature, goes down to Hades and absolutely shatters death. We no longer have to fear death. We do come back. David desired to say, my son is not coming back. It turns out Christ does precisely what David desired to do, except Christ fulfills what David's desires were. Mm -hmm. Would that I had died in your stead, Absalom. That's what Christ went and did for us. He went and tasted death so that none of us, even though we taste death, death, where is your sting? Death has no more power, right? And lest a, a, a grain of wheat fall into the ground, it has no life. Christ was that Christ was that David going into Hades to destroy death, to trample down death, right? Uh, by dying on our behalf. Uh, so that he could, fact, in fact, fulfill that, would that I had died in your stead. He goes and he dies in our stead so that so that we not uh, so that we don't aren't just simply annihilated and cut off from God. So those would be I'm, I don't want to get into all of the Psalms and everything like that. But those are two two places uh, uh, from the um, from uh, our talk today that I could that I could point you to the way in which I think Christ fulfills uh, David's desires there. I see. Well, on that note of profundity, um, thank you so much, Professor Justin Jackson of Hillsdale College. You've been very gracious with your time and your wonderful insights. Uh, it's great talking with you again. Yes. Uh, and I hope I wish you all the best with your school year and take care of yourself. Great. Thank you.